Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the April NAMI North Texas meeting. I am Chris, the program director. We will be starting in about three or four minutes, kind of give everybody a chance to kind of trickle in here. So uh, go ahead, and if you haven't yet used the facilities or grabbed a snack, go ahead and do that now, please. Thank you. And you're welcome to chat with us while we're waiting for additional people to jump in. For an extra five dollars. I'm just kidding. <gasps> it's a nonprofit. We got to find. What happened to no cost <laughs> services? <laughs> for a five dollar donation. There you go. That's better. <laughs> Hi. See, we have Claudia too. Yay. Yep. It's coming on. I don't know if I've, I've actually met Anne or Vanessa yet. This would be good. Hey, Hi, Claudia. Claudia. Hello, everybody. Long time no see you. I know, a long time no see you. <laughs> we went to see the. Uh, Prelude Clubhouse. Oh, that's right. It took us an hour to get over there. One hour. I had a hard time getting out of Dallas and getting back to our you know, house out here in Gum Barrel. I ended up, I helped kick off the support group meeting today until our substitute facilitator get, could get on. And I ended up having to pull over on the side of the freeway in a gas station and use my phone as a hotspot <laughs> to get on. Wow. I, could not get out of Dallas. Hi, Arlene. Hey, Arlene, how are you? <laughs> was it traffic or? Good. <laughs> yeah, it, it was just, it was packed downtown trying to get out and there was really no reason for it. Everybody just was going under the speed limit. And then once it opened up, it opened up. It's like, why? <laughs> yeah. Wow. All right, so it is five after seven, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, we may have some more folks trickling here or there as we go through, and if we do, we'll go ahead and let them in. Uh, like I said, for those of you who have not met me before, my name is Chris Payne. I am the Director of Programs and Ops here at NAMI North Texas, and welcome to our April uh, meeting, public meeting. Uh, the topic tonight will be uh, talking about the eight dimensions of wellness and how to tell when you're not well and using those as a tool to identify what is going on with your mental health and ways that you can work in improving your mental health. Uh, but before we do that, we'll go ahead and get into the announcements. Uh, with our programs, we are coming up on the end of the spring cycle. Most of our uh, classes are ending or have ended. We have a few that are still growing through the rest of the spring. Uh, with that, that means that we are prepping up for the summer. So we are already starting to make plans for our summer classes. Uh, we are going to have a peer-to-peer -peer class, which is a class we have not had for a couple of cycles. So I am proud to say and glad to say that we'll have a peer-to-peer -peer class. Uh, we'll also have family to family, uh, de familia a familia, and I believe we may also have a basics class. That's not yet confirmed in stone. Uh, but we will have multiple options of several of those classes, all total. Uh, so we're in the planning stages for that now. We plan on having the actual announcements of our publication of those classes on our website somewhere around the beginning of May. And we will allow those on the wait list about uh, a week to two weeks to go ahead and get on those classes. And then we'll open them up for the general public. So if you are not 
on the wait list and you're wanting to sign up for those classes, get on the wait list and get a two week head start. All right. So uh, with the rest of our programs and groups, we have our peer uh, connections recovery support groups and our family support groups. Those are going well. I am proud to say that we have a new connections recovery support group that will be launching in uh, later this month, actually in two days. And that group will be uh, officially run by Rebecca and Rufus. Uh, they're both getting trained right now. One is already trained, one will be getting trained. I'll be helping them to get that group off and up and off the ground. And it should be off and running uh, with Rebecca and Rufus together in June. Uh, so that group will be starting. That is going to be the second and fourth Saturdays of each month from 1.30 to 3. It will be virtual for now. That group may transition to being uh, in vivo live uh, sometime in the summer. We're still playing with that to see if we are able to do that. But for now, it will be virtual. Okay. Uh, with our walk coming up at the uh, tail end of May, we've got that coming. Uh, we have so far raised... I believe over 40,000, is that right, Athena? And we have how many teams, 100 and something? Um, we have about 250 participants. I think we're at somewhere around 40, 45 teams. 40, 45 teams, okay. So uh, Haley is not here this, or this evening to share with the watch. She's actually going and, and speaking elsewhere about the watch. So I'm gonna have Athena kind of get us uh, up to date on what is going on with the NAMI Watch. So Athena, what's going on? Okay, so if you don't know me yet, um, my name is Athena Trent and I'm the Executive Director of NAMI North Texas. And I am very excited to say that our walk, one way or another, is going to be in person this year. We've already done yeah. a walk through at Frisco Rough Riders Stadium. We'll be right back where we used to be pre-pandemic. Yeah. Um, if there ends up being another COVID variant and we have to be careful. We will limit the number of people that can show up in person, but it is outdoors. So I don't see any issues. And so far, so everything looks good. And we have so many amazing things planned this year. Um, our 2020 walk chairs, Kevin Hagland and Jeff Cavanaugh from, well, Jeff is no longer at 105.3 The Fan, but He's doing his own YouTube sports casting. They um, are local sports radio celebrities. They were the chairs of our walk in 2020 when we had to shut down just before it happened and they wanted a do over. So we thought the most appropriate thing was give them first shot at our first walk post pandemic or I don't know if you'd call it post yet, but anyway, being able to be in person. So they are back, they are fun, they are funny. And um, watch your email, watch social media, watch our website. We are going to be having um, walk rallies um, in all different places across all of our service area, all four counties, Collin, Denton, Rockwall, and Dallas. Just little pop-up rallies to get people signed up, participating. And we are already ahead of what we've been in previous years in relation to participants. Uh, registered participants, teams, sponsorships, and money raising. And it's more important than ever to help us raise money so we can continue to provide no cost services. Um, and what we found is during the pandemic, needs for our services and demand for our services went up significantly. We thought as people were going to be um, getting back into their daily routines, going back to work and feeling somewhat normalized that the demand would go back down, but we're actually seeing it rise, especially with family members based on the phone calls we're receiving um, for references to services. So um, our community needs us more than ever. And, you know, it's not just about fundraising. We're good. Frisco Rough Riders Park, if you haven't been there yet, they have, it's so family friendly. There's actually a playground for the kids. We're going to have, hopefully have some um, mascots from some of the different sports teams in the area, and we've got plans for um, a short yoga um, event just before we get started so we can get limbered up and get that walk or maybe two walks around the stadium grounds. Um, 
people singing, maybe some people dancing, some entertainment and um, some testimonials. It's going to be an amazing welcome back to our in-person mental health community. And we really want to make it extra special so that we can bring ourselves together. And, you know, the whole point of the walk, other than the fundraising, is really to show each other that we are here for, here for each other, and that there is a community out there where nobody's alone in this process. And that is the one time a year that we can all get together and show that support for each other. So we are very excited. So go to either namiNorthTexas.org and click on NAMI Walks, or you can go to namiWalks.org slash North Texas, and you can register right away if you haven't yet, and you can start raising money now um, and set up Facebook fundraisers. And we do have prizes for, you know, incentive gifts at different points. Um, for raising a certain amount of money before a certain date, before we even get to the walk. But we will have an amazing prize, which we have not revealed yet, for whoever raises the most money. Um, last year, it was Dallas Cowboy tickets. This year, something just as awesome or maybe even better. So we will make that announcement later on. And if anybody has questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it back to Chris. All right. Appreciate it, Athena. So before we get started, we have one other special announcement to make. We have a new kid on the block, a new employee at the office. Her name is Tiffany Gomez. She is the program assistant, and she comes to us from Boston, MA. And uh, she is currently getting working on her MSW degree and then getting her license. She had a license in MA. At the bachelor level, she's now working on getting her master's level license. So Tiffany, would you like to say anything? What an intro. I appreciate you. Um, I just look forward to working with all the volunteers and with you all. So I'm happy to be here. Yay. Well, we're glad to have you, Tiffany. Thank you. <laughs> and we're, we're extremely excited to have Tiffany on our team. She's in her first week and she's already dove in. And um, we, she will be your go-to person. She will be in charge of managing all volunteers. So we're going to get that aspect of, um, of NAMI North Texas back up because we are getting an enormous amount of requests coming in for in-person events. And we're going to be needing all of our volunteers back. We'll have plenty for you to do. So watch <laughs> our social media and emails and everything for us ramping that volunteer program back up. So if you see an email from Tiffany Gomez, it's not spam. Open it. <laughs> Good right. to know. Good to know. So we will go ahead and get started with the presentation. All right. So our presentation tonight is discussing the eight dimensions of wellness. And this was a uh, something that the, SAM the SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, published in 2016. And these are eight areas of our mental health or eight areas of our everyday life that have an impact on our mental health. And I felt that this was a good topic that should be discussed, especially as we are moving from pandemic to endemic stage, maybe bouncing back and forth, who knows, that this would be something that is a good tool that our community can use to kind of gauge how they're doing with their mental health and how to move forward with it, okay? So this is the eight dimensions of wellness, how to tell when you're not well, all right? So instead of me sitting here doing a prolonged, you know, bio like I normally do with all of our guest speakers, here's just an introduction of me. This is me and my son, Jeremy, and my service dog, Dale. Uh, I am a licensed clinical social worker. Uh, I am trained in cognitive processing therapy and EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Both of these are excellent therapy styles when used with trauma, which is the background of my therapy has been trauma and suicide prevention. And then I'm also trained in critical incident stress management, which I use when uh, conducting critical incident debriefs with law enforcement agencies, fire departments, et cetera, after they've experienced a bad call and their first responders 
need 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 to just talk about what they've been through so that they don't bottle it up. Uh, I am a former Army veteran. Uh, I was a combat medic in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I am a licensed social worker. I had my got I graduated from grad school in December seventeen. Got my LMSW uh, February of eighteen. Was able to get it upgraded to my LCSW after the three thousand clinical hours and one hundred super super vision hours. We'll just go with that. Uh, I do have a strong background in peer support. Uh, in the Army, we had mandated reporters, just like we have in regular everyday life. Uh, and most of the mandated reporters were um, officers and non-commissioned officers. As a medic, I would had a security clearance, but I did not have any sort of mandated reporting. So guess who all the Joes went to when they needed to talk about something? They came to me and the other medics. So that's where my background in peer support really began was in mentoring and helping out my fellow soldiers going all the way back to 2008 when I enlisted. Uh, then my background with mental illness began in 1988. That's not when I was born. That was when I was diagnosed um, with ADHD. And then I have since been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress and um, major depressive disorder. And my son, who you see pictured here, has also been diagnosed with autism, ASD. So that is also another mental illness that has affected me and my family. So that is who I am. This is what we're here to talk about, the eight dimensions of wellness. All right, so these are the eight areas that have an effect, our emotional dimension, the financial dimension, the social dimension, the spiritual dimension, occupational, physical, intellectual, environmental. We'll go through each one of these individually. I won't just throw them all at you, okay? So the best way to look at these dimensions is like a tent, okay? So what is a tent designed to do? Well, a tent is designed to protect us from the elements, right? What do you see here holding up the tent, right? You see ropes and stakes that are holding the tent up, right? Without these ropes and stakes, what happens to the tent when wind comes along? just falls over, right? So the eight dimensions, a good way to look at them is that these are the, the, the uh, tent states that are holding up your tent, your life, so to speak, right? If you lose one tent state, or, or is your tent gonna be okay? Yeah, it'll be okay with one tent state, you know, missing. What about a second one? Yeah, it'll be okay. What about a third one or a fourth one? Now it starts to get a bit dicey, right? So these eight areas you can look at as the tent states that are holding up your tent. When the winds of life come along, if you have good solid foundation for most of your dimensions, you're gonna be okay. If you have some tent states that are a bit rocky, if you have a couple of dimensions that are not healthy and are not in the best of shape, you're more likely to have uh, to succumb to mental health issues. All right, so that doesn't mean that you won't have them. That just means that you're more likely to have issues with those um, mental health conditions. Right, the resiliency to be able to overcome is not going to be as strong. That's a better way of looking at it, okay? So the way that we do that is by looking for balance. So as we go through each one of these dimensions, we're gonna talk about you know, what these dimensions are, what are some things that help to improve this dimension, and contrastly, what are some things that cause this dimension to not be uh, effective for some people. And the thing that we're looking for is balance, okay? If we have one or two things in one dimension, that are, you know, they're, they're not exactly healthy. As long as we have things to counterbalance it, we're doing okay, all right? But if it's like three or four things that are unhealthy and only one thing that's healthy, that's not really going to be very effective, all right? So again, we're looking at the, tents, the tent pits that are keeping the tent up. And in order to make sure those tent spikes are able to uh, withstand the elements, we want to make sure that there's balance being created within each one of the dimensions, okay? So I first came across the eight dimensions of wellness when I was doing research in grad school on developing a suicide prevention um, program or suicide prevention type of teaching. Uh, and I came across this from a, um, a, a U.S. Air Force chaplain was using the four dimensions of wellness uh, from SAMHSA as a way of identifying um, airmen who were at risk for suicide. 
So I started looking a little bit deeper and discovered that they had recently expanded that from four dimensions to eight dimensions. And that this was, again, still something that they were using to identify people who may be having, you know, increased suicidal thoughts or their mental health conditions were deteriorating rapidly. So that is why I came into it. As I mentioned earlier, my background is in trauma and suicide prevention, hence the eight dimensions of wellness and why I find it so effective. Uh, when I was actually providing services, this was one of the first things I would talk about with each one of my clients to help identify where they were in um, the eight dimensions. Were they doing well? Were there some rocky areas? Were there some areas where they didn't even recognize that they were having issues until we actually discovered them while we were going through this? And then what do we do to start working on those issues to make sure that that suicidal ideation doesn't start to creep in? So that's where all this is coming from. This is why I feel like this would be very um, instrumental in our population as we're moving from one phase to another phase with COVID and everything to make sure that we are making sure that we're taking care of ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let's talk about each one of the dimensions. Uh, I like to do alphabetical order because that just makes sense to me. So we'll start with the emotional dimension, okay? So this is from uh, SAMHSA's publication in 2016. The emotional dimension involves the ability to express feelings, adjust to emotional challenges, cope with life stressors, and enjoy life. It includes knowing our strengths as well as what we want to get better at and living and working on our own, but letting others help us from time to time, right? So the emotional dimension then is gonna be the area of our life where we are able to regulate and identify our emotions, be able to process our emotions, be able to figure out how our emotions are affecting us, et cetera, okay? So how do we improve our areas of our emotional dimension, all right? So if you are looking at your own life, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands or a volunteer or anyone is to be like, I'm not doing well in my emotional dimension. We're not putting anybody on the spot. But if you're kind of looking at your emotional dimension, kind of thinking about, you know, how am I doing with anger management? How am I doing with overreacting? How am I doing with processing trauma? How am I doing with being able to identify what emotions I'm feeling and then acting logically on those emotions? Or am I just allowing the emotions to overcome me and then I just go wherever the emotions take me, right? So areas that we can work on within the emotional dimension that can help to improve that include being self-aware of our feelings and thinking patterns. We all have specific thinking patterns. Some of those thinking patterns may not always be healthy for us. There's a uh, a branch of therapy called cognitive behavioral therapy, where the entire premise of cognitive behavioral therapy is recognizing thinking patterns that are unhealthy, learning to bury those thinking patterns, not bury, but get rid of those thinking patterns and replace them with more healthy or more accurate thinking patterns, right? So I'll use myself as an example, um, not because I think that I'm great or anything, but I don't have to deal with HIPAA if I'm just explaining me. Right? I don't have to worry about release of information or any of that stuff. Uh, I mentioned that I had an ADHD diagnosis when I was four years old. I went up through my entire childhood thinking that that meant that I had a learning disorder and therefore I'm stupid. So that was my thinking pattern all throughout my childhood and early adulthood. I'm stupid. Why should I put forth any effort? Why should I try anything? I'm stupid. It doesn't matter. It wasn't until I got to the army that that thinking pattern changed. Right. So being able to identify our thinking patterns, being able to identify whether they're healthy thinking patterns or unhealthy thinking patterns, being aware of our feelings and, and are we allowing our feelings to control us or are we allowing ourselves a moment to step back and examine our feelings? This is something if you're into philosophy or anything, this is a very stoic approach using stoicism, not acting on our emotions, but taking a step back and examining our emotions before we act on them. All right, self-care, if you are taking care of yourself, this is emotional dimension is going to be very strong, right? Are you taking the time out to go read a book or go get a pedicure or manicure or go play golf or just go and clear your head? Or are you putting, you trying to cram 30 hours into your 24 hour day? Okay, so how are you doing with self-care? Stress and resiliency, how are you doing with stress and resiliency? Are you able to maintain a healthy amount of stress because a healthy amount of stress is actually beneficial. 
or are you allowing the stress to pile up and pile up and pile up to where it's not beneficial anymore? Are you resilient? Are you able to bounce back? Are you able to not allow the stands of time or the, the storm or whatever euphemism you want to use to, to knock you down? Are you able to, to get back up again? What was that? What was that song? I did not down. I did back up again. Anyway, that's my ADHD. My, my, ooh, shiny. Anyway, um, developing coping skills. Don't 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 shake your head. <laughs> All right. So developing coping skills, right? Do we have good coping skills that we can rely on to, to be ways of relieving stress when the stress becomes too much? Right? Do we have those books? Do we have those entertainments? Do we have those hobbies? Do we have that gym time? Right? How are we doing with developing those coping skills? All of these things determine the factor when it comes to uh, addressing our emotional dimension. All right. So our environmental dimension. All right. The environmental dimension involves being able to be safe and feel safe. Right. This can include accessing clean air, food and water, uh, preserving the areas where we live, learn and work, occupying pleasant, stimulating environments that support our well-being. Promoting learning, contemplation, and relaxation in natural places and spaces. Right. So the environment that we operate in also has a very major impact on our mental health. And if you look at suicide uh, statistics, this actually is a great illustration of that. If you look at the top five states for suicide, you're going to have, I can't remember if this is the order now or if it's shifted a little bit, but you're going to have Montana, Alaska, Idaho. New Mexico and Utah, right? The environment in a lot of those states is not exactly ideal, right? In Alaska, it's dark half the year. It's sub-freezing half the year. Your nearest next door neighbor may be a polar bear halfway, you know, half a mile down the road, right? So it's a very hard, stressful environment. That is going to have an impact on your mental health, just as much as, say, working in an office with white walls and no decorations and the annoying air conditioning fan blowing cold air on you 24 seven and the beeping outside and the, the horns honking from the cars, right? All those things are gonna have an effect on your mental health, specifically in the environmental dimension, All right? So let's take a look at some of the things you can do to improve your environmental dimension. Right, nature versus man-made. How are you doing with surrounding yourself with natural things rather than man-made things? Are you going for walks during the middle of the day out in, you know, in a park? Are you taking the time off over the weekend to maybe go fishing or go hiking or go camping or we're coming up on the summer, so maybe go boating, go swimming, uh, go see a friend, you know, out and doing nature stuff, or are you just surrounding yourself with inanimate objects that don't have any sort of, of connection with, right? There's a lot of research out there that talks about the connection that we have with nature, specifically when it comes to energies and chais and stuff like that with, with the trees and the plants and things like, of that nature, right? Are you going out and taking advantage of that or are you just sitting here in the cold and barren waste of a man-made room, right? Auditory stimulation. How many of us like to listen to music? How many of us like to listen to music when we're really stressed out or when we're concentrating or we're, when we're trying to calm ourselves, right? That's part of that auditory stimulation. So what are you doing to surround yourself if you can't get out and enjoy nature, right? What are you doing to surround yourself with things that are pleasant, right? Do you have aromatherapy, right? Do you have a, a humidifier with, with scented scents and all that? I used to have that when I was seeing clients and then I had a client who was allergic to lavender and I had to stop. Right, but there are other things that you you can do as well. You can have, you know, stop music in the background. You can have a YouTube video with a campfire or something like that, like you always have in my office. Right. So, what are you doing to increase the pleasant sounds around you rather than listening to the sirens or the the car horns or the traffic or the gunshots or all the other stuff that you hear when you live in the city? All right. So financial dimension, this is the, uh, whoops, the next one for uh, these dimensions. The financial dimension involves things such as income, debt, savings, 
as well as a person's understanding of financial processes and resources. A person's satisfaction with their current financial situation and future prospects also comes into play. So this is going to be a difficult one for some people because financially they are not as well off as some others or they don't have as much opportunity as some others. But that doesn't mean that this is still, that, that this is not an area where you can have strengths in. How are you doing with savings? How are you doing with debt? How are you doing with making sure that you have an extra uh, dollar or two in your pocket just in case, right? So things that we can uh, use to improve our financial dimension include income, right? How are you doing with the $4 a gallon price tag for gasoline? What are you doing to try to get around that or to make sure that that is not something that holds you back? Um, savings and investing, finding ways to save, even if it's you know $5 a month. That five dollars, as you put it in certain accounts, that can become, you know, uh, compound interest and build on itself, and that can quickly become something in a short amount of time. How are you doing with consolidating debt? How are you doing with the credit cards? Are you, um, you know, reading the debt management books, or are you just going out and, and creating more debt for yourself? Cost of living. How are you doing with keeping up with the cost of living? What are some of the ways that you can work on adjusting for that? And then how are you educating yourself when it comes to money? How many of you really understand the ins and outs of a mortgage? I don't. How many of you understand the ins and outs of the, what was the term I used earlier? The, um, uh, with the savings, the our trop, uh, compound interest and stuff like that, right? Are those words that you understand? If not, maybe it would be beneficial for you to start to educate yourself a little bit and understand how the money works. and. Maybe that'll be something that you can use to your benefit. All right. Uh, next one is our intellectual dimension, All right? So this involves many things that keep our brains active and our intellect expanding. In a broad sense, this dimension can involve looking at different perspectives of an issue and taking them into consideration. This is something, by the way, that's called cognitive reframing or cognitive flexibility. I'll talk about that in a minute. Through a number of activities, from worrying about current events to organizing game nights in your home or community center, you can broaden your perspective and understanding through diverse points of view. All right, so how are you doing with your intellectual dimension? Are you keeping your brain active and healthy? Are you finding new ways of reframing and looking at things? I mentioned cognitive flexibility. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to look at a situation, whether it's a situation you're in or a situation someone else is in, and being able to find different interpretations or different ways of looking at that situation. Great example of this, you're, you're driving in traffic or better yet, you're not driving in traffic, you're stuck in traffic. Once again, because there's been another accident on 75, 635, 30, 183, all, all the numbers, there's another accident, right? So as you get up on to the scene, what are you doing? You're rubbernecking just like everybody else that you were yelling and cussing at because they were rubbernecking, right? And as you're looking, what are you looking over at the scene and what are you doing? Well, you may be trying to figure out, huh, gee, I wonder what happened over there. It looks like that car may have hit that car or maybe that car or she's crying and that guy's yelling. I bet one of them hit each other and then that flash of a minute is gone because now you got to accelerate and move on. Right? You just had a three second opportunity to assess everything at the accident scene to figure out what happened. Is that enough time? Do you have enough information? Do you have the toxicology report from the criminal investigation? Do you have the crash report from the investigation? Do you have the closed circuit television uh, camera from the ATM across the street? Do you have eyewitness reports? Yeah, we don't have any of that, but being able to take all of those extra pieces of information into account and then look at what the information is providing you, that's what cognitive flexibility is. It's being able to take all of the information or to find all of that information and then apply it to your situation, right? So someone who is very strong in their intellectual dimension will be able to do that, as the uh, quote here from uh, Samson talks about, all right? So things that can improve your intellectual dimension, right? Obviously, getting education is going to be uh, one of the big ones here. Uh, and it doesn't just mean that you have to go to like a four-year school, 
right? There are all sorts of online classes, online tutorials with YouTube, going to the library and, and looking things up and educating and, and getting information. Um, I know a guy who has really into muscle cars and he's learned everything he can about muscle cars from watching YouTube videos. <coughs> and he's actually really good. And a lot of people turn to him for advice and mentorship when it comes to muscle cars. And he learned everything from YouTube. Right. So there, there are ways of getting around and gaining education. Uh, that constant flexibility that I just talked about. Uh, mental exercises. How do we do with games like Sudoku or crossword puzzles or things that really keep our mind going? Right. My dad uh, is has uh, stage four Alzheimer's. He was diagnosed with dementia, uh, dementia about six or seven years ago, and it's now progressing to stage four Alzheimer's. But the progression has been slower than expected because he's been doing Sudoku's and mental exercises and reading and, and doing the things that he needs to do to try to make sure that he is maintaining activity and, and working his brain. And that is helping to slow down the, the, the deterioration that he's going through. He's 80 years old, he's, there's gonna be deterioration, right? But he's been able to slow it down because of what he's done with the mental exercises. If that can help an 80 year old man stave off the effects of Alzheimer's for an extra couple of years, what can it do for a 20 year old, a 30 year old, a 50 year old? Something to think about. All right, the occupational dimension. All right, so this involves participating in activities that provide meaning and purpose and reflect personal values, interests, and beliefs, including employment. But you'll notice it says including employment. That doesn't mean that it's just employment. This can be volunteer opportunities, this can be hobbies. This can be things that you do that provide meaning and purpose to your life. All right, so um, ways that you can improve your occupational dimension, finding things that provide self-fulfillment, right? Do you enjoy dogs? Well, if your answer is no, let go ahead and close out of this, this meeting. You, you want me to talk to you more. I have a service dog, no, I'm just kidding, right? So if you have a lot of self-fulfillment from dogs, have you gone to Patriot Paws to volunteer with them? Have you gone to your local animal shelter? Have you done something around dogs that brings you self-fulfillment? Maybe it's something to look into. That can also be applied to um, individuals who are in nursing homes or individuals who are in hospice care or individuals who are in some other living condition that is not quote unquote normal, right? Maybe you can find self-fulfillment in those areas and that can improve your occupational dimension. Or finding your sense of purpose. Uh, I have a quote later on here in the, in the uh, slideshow. Uh, there's a gentleman named Victor Frankel. He was a psychiatrist, either psychologist or psychiatrist, I can't remember which, uh, but he was an Austrian Jew who spent six years in Auschwitz and Dachau in the 1930s and 40s in uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, and he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's, and in that book, he talked about how having a sense of purpose helped a lot of the Jews who were in the camps be able to overcome, get through the adversity that they were experiencing and having the resilience to be able to have a life after they got out of the camps. Right, because they identified some sort of sense of purpose. For him, it was being able to finish his doctorate, uh, present his paperwork and get his doctorate degree so that he could help people. That was his sense of purpose. Do you have a sense of purpose? What is it? Maybe that's something that you can work on. All right, your physical dimension, the one that I definitely am not the greatest in. All right. Um, physical dimension is a healthy body, good physical health habits, nutrition, exercise, appropriate health care, right? These make up the physical dimension of wellness. A few ways we can get there might be choosing things that make our body feel good and turning back to things that bring us down. <coughs> we can also feel better by creating a routine that balances activity within activity, and that is manageable within our obligations and needs. Our body is intelligent and learning to listen to it more deeply may be very important and empowering. All right, so how are you doing with your physical health? 
How many of you put on the COVID-15 or the COVID-30 or the COVID insert embarrassing number here, right? We all probably had to some extent, right? We've all have probably had ups and downs with our health. I have been as light as 180 pounds and I've been as heavy as 320 pounds, right? A lot of us probably maybe not that drastic, but we can all probably have go back to our, you know, uh, body image and how that has an effect on our mental health. It has an effect on our mental health. So that might be something to think about. Okay. So how are you doing with that? Are you having good nutrition? Are you eating all of the fruits and vegetables and, and, and keto diets and everything else? Or are you eating all the carbs like I do? Right. How are you doing in physical activity? Are you getting out and walking or exercising or stimulating your mind through through exercise as you stimulate your body or are you sitting there in front of the computer screen all day how are your sleeping patterns right are you able to get a good night's sleep or are you not or not doing good sleep hygiene and doing things like eating dinner in the in your bed or watching tv in your bed or a lot of those other things that if you talk to someone who's a sleep expert they'll talk to you about sleep hygiene how are you doing with drugs? Are you prescribed medications? Are you taking those medications as prescribed? Are you interacting with illicit drugs and, and, and copious amounts of alcohol? Right? Those things are going to have an effect on our mental health and our physical health, which will have an impact on our mental health. So with drugs and alcohol, you have a one-two point there. It's going to affect both of them right off the bat. Right? And then how are you doing preventative measures? Are you going in for your annual checkup? I'm about a year and a half from 40. I'm not looking forward to that, right? But it's an annual checkup that I'm just still need to do because I need to be taking care of myself. How are you doing with taking care of yourself? When's the last time you, you went to the doctor? When's the last time you went to your therapist? When's the last time you went to a dentist, right? All of these things can come into play when it comes to our physical dimension and taking care of ourselves, right? For someone like me, I... I usually have no problem talking to Jim Beam, but when it comes to talking to gymnasium, we don't have a very good relationship. So we need to be able to put away Jim Beam, go talk to Mr. Nasium and get working on it. Okay, dad jokes aside, moving on. Okay, uh, our social dimension, right? Being able to uh, interact with each other, right? Our social dimension involves having healthy relationships with friends, family, and the community having an interest in and concern for the needs of others and humankind, right? Our social dimension is a very big part of who we are and has a very big effect on our mental health. This was very evident during COVID-19 when we were all asked or told, however you wanna look at it, to self-isolate and stay home and not interact with each other. And our mental health issues went through the roof because we were no longer seeing each other. We were no longer having physical contact. We were no longer you know, going out and, and having a drink or having a social gathering or playing softball or you know, going to pit nets and doing all this other stuff that we do together, right? So our social dimension has a very pivotal impact on our mental health. So some ways that you can improve your social dimension. How are you doing with social interactions? Are you getting out there and engaging with folks? How about your sense of community? Do you have a good sense of community around you? Do you know who are the people that you can turn to when you're struggling? Or do you feel like if you look around, it's like, it's just me out here. I don't have any community. How are you doing with that support system? How are you doing with developing those people within that sense of community and being able to identify who you can talk to? How are you doing with time management? Are you always going somewhere? Are you always um, running late because you're, you're not having good time management skills? Or are you always looking at the clock and trying to be like, okay, I need to get out of here. It's not time yet. And robbing yourself of that ability to have social interactions with each other. All right, so that's, these are some areas that you can work on with your social dimension. All right, and then the spiritual dimension. I believe this is the last one. Uh, this is a broad concept that represents one's personal beliefs and values and involves having meaning, purpose, and a sense of balance and peace. 
So this includes recognizing our search for meaning and purpose in human existence, as well as developing appreciation for life and the natural forces that exist in the universe. All right, so a very interesting thing that if you look at statistical research when it comes to suicide, and I'm not trying to put my personal beliefs or any personal beliefs when it comes to spirituality or religion onto anyone. However, statistically, it is shown that people who have a spiritual lifestyle have a higher resiliency of overcoming suicidal ideation. Right. And a lot of the researchers are pointing out to the, the fact that someone who has a spiritual lifestyle, whether it's Christianity, Buddha, um, uh, pagan, Druid, whatever, they have this thing called hope. They have a hope that they can look forward to. If you look at the definition of, or if you look at the emotions that people most have when they're having suicidal thoughts, it's helplessness and hopelessness. How are you doing with hope? What are you putting your hope in? What are you looking forward to that brings you hope? That can be a religion. That can be a non-religion. It can be something that is you know, of this world, so to speak, right? What are you putting your faith in that you can look forward to, all right? So what are the fundamental beliefs that kind of craft or form what you put your hope in. How are you doing with hope versus hopelessness? Are you able to find hope in things? If you're experiencing hopelessness, maybe that is worthy of a conversation with somebody like a counselor or a chaplain or a friend or a deacon or a padre, someone that you can talk to to discover what is there in this life that you can have hope for. It's really easy to look at the news and think that there's no hope left in this world. And it doesn't matter what your religious or political beliefs are, that is all over the place, okay? And then what is your sense of purpose? Or for some people, they like to use the word, what is your calling, right? What are the things that drive you into creating hope for others? And if so, creating hope for yourself, right? Wrong way. So he who has a why to live can bear almost any how. So this is very closely tied into that spiritualness or that sense of purpose. If you can understand why you have gone through the things that you have gone through, you can withstand any how. How did this, how did I get here? How did this happen? If you're able to identify a why, you can withstand any how. So, these are the eight dimensions of wellness, emotional, financial, social, spiritual, occupational, physical, intellectual, and environmental. So then looking at this, you may be looking through, and remember I was talking about the tent pens and you know, finding ways to keep in balance. You may be looking through and going, you know what? I got, I'm, I've got a lot of strengths in this, these areas. I'm pretty good, which is good, right? As a clinical social worker, I'm trained to provide strengths-based practice, right? finding the strengths that a person has and utilizing those strengths to help them to push through something, which is 100% effective and is very strong and powerful, right? However, one of the things that we learned from COVID and these last couple of years is that those strengths can really not be as strong as we thought they were. For example, if the, the, the big strong strengths that you had in your dimensions are you had a really strong social dimension you had a really strong financial and occupational dimension, and you had a pretty good physical dimension, right? And then you were told to isolate. Then you were furloughed because you, your job couldn't sustain you because they weren't generating any money because nobody was coming in because everybody's staying home, right? And then you were sitting around not able to do anything and you lost that sense of purpose and, and your occupational dimension. And then because you weren't able to go to the gym and did all this out on a speed bag or run you know, 800 miles an hour on the treadmill, and because you live in a part of the city that's very not friendly, you didn't feel comfortable going out and running yourself because you had a poor environmental dimension, now you have a poor physical dimension. Now, all those areas where you had strengths, they're not there anymore. 
this is what happened to a lot of us as we entered into the COVID phase and dealing with COVID. A lot of those areas where we were strong, they all came under attack all at the same time. So strengths-based and being able to focus on your strengths to be able to get through is very effective. We also need to find ways of in, uh, reinforcing and improving a lot of those weak areas so that they don't hold us back, right? So one thing I wanna challenge you all to do, the weak areas that you have, find one thing that you can change in one of those weak areas that you can use to start improving. This isn't gonna be a, hey, two weeks later, I'm, I've, I've saved $800. Well, for one, if you saved $800 in two weeks, um, write a book about that, you'll make millions, okay? So, but this is not gonna be something that's gonna be you know, instantaneous, it's gonna be over time. So find one thing in one of your weak dimensions that you can work on and start improving it. And then as that gets stronger and stronger and stronger, find something else start working on it and slowly build up those weak areas so that if those strong areas come under attack again, you don't have only weak areas that you can fall back on, okay? So remember, this is the temp heads that are holding up your life. You have to find balance in order to keep those temp heads from collapsing, which in turn prevents your tent from collapsing. All right. Are there any questions? Any answers? I don't have a question. I have kind of a comment because this is like, this is really good. I've never seen eight dimensions. I've seen the six and growing up in the indigenous culture, we have something called a medicine wheel. If not everybody's familiar with the medicine wheel, it's divided into four equal parts. I literally tattooed it on my arm, right. but um, that's the philosophy of life in my culture. And it, the equal parts represent like the four directions, the four sacred herbs, four stages of life. And for us, we have the same concept, but it's just, it's only the emotional, spiritual, um, intellectual, and yeah, I can't even remember them all, but <clears throat> it's just the four. And that's kind of how I lived my life, but there's like the financial and, you know, occupational that just makes so sense, so much sense separating them out. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think, you know, we've got, you know, a small enough group here. I think we could just have a whole conversation on how that influences us. It doesn't even have to be questions. I think we can just sit and chat for a little bit about it because yeah, this I'm is done with that. I mean I, I I always struggled at first with understanding how occupational and financial are different and then I started working at nonprofits <laughs> and then it became also clear you can have a strong occupational and a not as strong financial my boss is listening I need to be very careful with how I use my word to <laughs> right we'll get but, there. We'll but get there. You, you you can have a very strong occupational dimension and maybe not quite as strong of a they don't have to be the same thing your occupation your finances are not entirely intertwined with each other right that was something that i really struggled with when i first started reviewing and trying to understand this and same with the opposite like you can make so much money but not be yeah in a you, good you can be Scrooge and have all the money in the world, but still bah humbug, you know, um, I almost said Jimmy Cricket. I almost got my fairy tales confused. <laughs> um, I can't think of, of... The little boy. Yeah, I, anyway, you, you can have I, all I the money in the world and be grumpy as heck because you have no occupational satisfaction. <clears throat> Tiny Tim, that's what I'm thinking of. I, uh, my personal opinion is then if you find a purpose of life, you can make everything else balance a little bit because in the moment then you know what you're here for, 
what is your purpose in life, you can balance everything. You can oh, yeah. manage you can manage the other strings and they are breaking. Um, because you see everything from a different perspective. And it happened to me whenever I just recently retired. Whenever you find your purpose, you say, this is what I meant to do all this time. And I don't have that much time to do it. Mm -hmm. My life become very balanced, better than never been. So I think that is one of the most important things. It will, it will strain your social life, your spiritual, your financial, your intellectual, everything. Once then you know exactly what you're here for. What's, what's your purpose? And of course, being in this uh, in this kind of environment when our purpose, one of our purpose in life is help others, it makes you feel fulfilling. It makes you feel like you ha your life have a purpose of it. How many people do you know who have helped others? Feed the, they've fed a homeless person, they've given shelter, they've donated, and then they're like, man, that felt horrible right you don't you, you don't come across that if you do you you run away from that person yeah right so i think this is a great example he who has a why to live can bear any how right for me i had a lot of exposure to suicide when i was in the army i had my own suicide attempt i witnessed the guy kill himself uh, I've done, I've had a lot of interactions with suicide and I struggled with why. And then I realized that, hey, I'm actually really good at talking to people. I can help to stop this. So all of that trauma that I've been through, it drove me to a purpose to stop others from being able to, to have to go through that. When you understand why you have gone through something Suddenly, no matter what comes at you, you're invincible. I can talk to that a little bit as well. It, it's, I put so much of my why into my career. That's why I focused on a career of education and nonprofits and you know, service. And that was fulfilling in my life, but the, where, all of my tent stakes fell pretty much at once is when I moved down here to Dallas to be with my husband and my why went away because I didn't have a job when I got here and I struggled finding one. And gosh, I wish I knew all of this before so I could like strengthen some of the other ones so I didn't have to worry about the occupational, you know, but they all literally collapsed when I didn't have that one why because that I put too much emphasis on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very similar situation. And same thing, moving to Dallas for my partner and not having anything. And so didn't even, like, because I was so focused on the occupational, like I wasn't focusing on the physical, I wasn't fo focusing on the social or the emotional, definitely not the emotional. But then slowly, like, the intellectual because I started school and so I found more of like this is my purpose you know learning to become an MS, like my MSW and helping people is my purpose so and then here I am so it's all coming together good and now you got a good solid occupational <laughs> right that's where you go yes yes I love Nami you know, hundred percent. She hasn't run away from us yet. It's only been four days, but <laughs> she keeps showing up. We're good <laughs> somehow. I don't know. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's been. It already feels like home. Like it. It's like it's only been four days, really. <laughs> I mean, staff members and Claudia are all talking. I is. There anyone else who, you know, needs the space to jump in at all? And it's fine if you just want to listen. 
That's not a problem at all. We can keep talking. We talk and laugh and joke around all day in between our hard work, so. Or for at least the next 28 minutes. <laughs> And this is the fun part. I did this a lot with um, when I did intercultural trainings with Americans. Americans hate silence. And I worked a lot with international students and people from all around the world. And certain cultures need the silence in order to be able to participate. And mm -hmm. it, it's kind of funny when you just take that moment and you give the space for those people who need it. And maybe there aren't any of those in the room and everybody who hate silence, was uncomfortable with silence, somebody has to speak. Notice, I had to speak and say mm -hmm. something. You know, where else that silence becomes very, uh, very much a tool and instrument that helps people is in therapy. When you got that awkward silence, therapists mm -hmm. love that because the you, you, you have to fill that silence with something and then you start sharing and talking. It's like, okay, keep going. I'm here, I'm listening. So silence can be a very powerful tool. Uh, I want to share something with you guys. I don't know if it, this is belong to this to this meeting or not. A couple of days ago, I was uh, I was going to buy groceries, and out of the corner of my eye, I turned around, and it's an area in Greenville in um, <clears throat> Lovers Lane. It's an area with the always and homeless people. And I turned around and I saw three or four guys sitting down in the floor and it was a pickup. And I saw a very well-dressed man doing something to one of them. And I turned around, so I said, what is he doing? Those are homeless people. So I turned the car, <clears throat> I forget about what I was going. I turned to see what he was doing to them. He was cutting their hair. One of the guys have a black, you know, the, those that plastic that you put in the, the, uh, in the salon. Yeah. There was, there was waiting for somebody. He did not have a sign in the pickup. He did not have an advertising. He was just cutting the homeless people's the hair. It, oh. it, it, made me, it made me cry. And I said, oh my God, I wish if we were, I, I, I would be myself cutting their hair. Make me feel really good. So I'm pretty sure this guy feels he can sleep well at night. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. That's for sure. And probably so could the homeless people. Maybe if their hair was very long and it was getting in their way and now they get a nice haircut. Yeah. That, that was amazing. That yeah. So a lot of times it's things that we do, but a lot of times it's things that somebody else does and make us feel good, they make us happy. Yeah. They, make, they make us cry of joy and think that somebody else is doing the same thing that we do. Yeah. Helps restore our faith in humanity when we've been through a couple of years where it's probably been uh, challenged. All right, so it's a little after eight. Uh, we will, I will go ahead and stop the share and we'll go ahead and stop the recording now. So for those of you who are watching uh, on YouTube or uh, from the website, y'all have a good night. And then for the rest of us,